they are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. The Declaration was created after the Second World War and one of the reasons behind it was the horrific things that had happened, especially under the Nazis, the claim that some human beings were subhuman, uh, that their interests and rights were of absolutely no account, and it was thought to be really important to establish the point that this is totally abhorrent and totally unacceptable, and that every human being uh, has the same rights to the basic kinds of things that are set out in the Declaration. All human beings means that there are no categories of human being that are excluded from the coverage of the Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are covered by it and that's tremendously important because hardly anybody in history probably has really believed that all human beings have the same rights. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, non-self-governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. Language is uh, the thing that defines our humanness. It's what makes us be humans at all. Everything that is, uh, every, everything about us that makes us different from the rest of, of the universe um, arises out of language and flows back into language. And so it's both the uh, it's both the thing that makes us all the same as humans, and it's the same. It's the thing that sets us apart. And everything else, all the other differences that that are in Article Two, are secondary and arise because of of the fact that humans use language. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. The the right to life means the um, the right to live out your whole. You know, to live, uh, if you're a kid, to live until you're an adolescent, if you're an adolescent, to live till you're grown up, and to be able to do all the stupid things that adolescents do, the reckless things that people do, in it, but, but you have a right to, to do those things and survive them. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. Slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Just to look at the U.S. context, if one thinks, for example, about the epidemic of incarceration in the United States, which has disproportionately um, affected young African American and Latino American men, and increasingly young African American and Latina American women, it seems to me um, that Article 4 can be used as a normative um, lever to challenge the sheer taken for grantedness of the hundreds of thousands of young men and women who have been caught up um, in the U.S. prison system um, and who spend a lot of their time uh, making goods uh, for and uh, being servants of U.S. corporations. So for me, um, what Article 4 does is what I think the international human rights law regime um, ought to do. Namely, it challenges 
a domestic legal order whose particular history is nested in legal provisions that accept slavery and accept it largely because they can call it by another name. No one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. I remember one time um, being told a story by people with whom I was arrested and they had been taken to a national park for torture. This is a national park where tourists go to watch animals, flamingos, antelopes, lions, uh, giraffes, buffaloes. And uh, they were taken to a secluded place in this national park where the police did not think uh, people could hear them screaming and all that. And they tied them up in uh, trees and they were beating them, I mean, so horribly uh, that somehow uh, buffaloes in the vicinity got interested and uh, they came around to watch. And I, when they told me this, I was just wondering what the buffalo, buffaloes were thinking about these human beings. What are they doing to one another and for what reason? And buffaloes watched as this uh, uh, spectacle of uh, beating and, uh, uh, and, and crying and killing was going on until darkness came and they disappeared. Uh, but torture actually what it does is that it, 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 it reduces human beings to a level that is below other beings. This is why it shouldn't be there. Everyone has the right to recognition everywhere as a person before the law. To be a person means to enjoy life. To be a person means to know what it is to love and to be loved. Um, people are going to ask me, well, how does this make it different from being an animal? And I don't know. You know, I don't really have a firm answer on that. I really don't. I think to be a person means to be in relationships with other persons and to be recognized by others. And so the definition is going to expand and contract according to the societies that we're in. Let's say um, to be recognized as a person before the law means to also, you know, mutual recognition that you as a person can also recognize, okay, there's a law here. And that the law is not just this abstract thing written in a book, but it's something that other people, that your peers have made. I see the the relationship of personhood as one of equals and of peers to say that okay these are other people like me and we've all made these laws and I see myself as subject to the law and the law sees me as being subject to it because the law is an expression of what all of us have discussed together. All are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination in violation of this declaration and against any incitement to such discrimination. Equality is conceived, I think, in this article as a collective good. Right? 
So it's not uh, just or just primarily a right that one individual has um, in relationship to law and legal institutions, uh, but it is a right that, although it may protect the individual in the particular case, is affirming uh, a good that is in some sense indivisible because it belongs to everybody. Everyone has the right to an effective remedy by the competent national tribunals for acts violating the fundamental rights granted him by the Constitution or by law. What is an effective remedy to torture, for example? It has to be more than money. It has to be something broad, something, for example, like guarantees of non-repetition. And this is something that really became elaborated in subsequent international law, such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and emerging theories of uh, the, the international duty to combat impunity, that a remedy is not just some gesture by the government, but it has to be enough, enough to stop the rights violation, enough to restore human dignity, even if you can never restore someone to their original position. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention, or exile. Exile has a lot to do with a particular individual having an attachment to country, to family, to religion, uh, to some sort of favorite feeling or thought. And when that is removed from that particular individual's uh, living sphere, you have like this barren person, this person that's totally devoid of who they are actually. And I think that's totally unjust. Everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal in the determination of his rights and obligations and of any criminal charge against him. There are today a lot of debates about, um, that re reflect on the complexity of the meaning of the word independent. And uh, that's, that's been something that the drafters of the Universal Declaration uh, probably hadn't anticipated. Because the, tr the, the courts at the time of the post-war period were all uh, uh, presumed to be national courts. And so the guarantee was equal protection before an independent court that was presumed to be a national court. But today, the big debate is whether uh, independent and and independence and impartiality might be best protected by an international court or by universal jurisdiction. And so today the question might be whether there's such a thing as too much independence and whether there are competing values um, at stake, um, and that is independence versus accountability. Uh, might there be courts that are independent, such as an international criminal tribunal, but that might be not have a stake in the matter? Or might there be a, a court somewhere in the world that might um, be independent with respect to, let's say, a controversy in Chile in the case of, of uh, General Pinochet, but not uh, be accountable to the people of Chile? So what we see today is that there are often competing rule of law uh, dilemmas and competing rule of law values that uh, complicate the issue of what is an independent and impartial tribunal.